Hi everyone and welcome back to my channel. In today's video, I'm going to be talking about white and yellow syndrome. I've been asked to cover this for years. However, I have avoided doing so because every single time I talk about white and yellow syndrome, I am met with some level of upset in the breeding community. And the last time I talked about it was my problematic morphs video in which I did not talk about white and yellow in any way untrue. And I was very respectful, or at least I thought I was being very respectful about the fact that there are plenty of lines of white and yellow that are fine and there's some that aren't. But nonetheless, of breeders in the community still were upset and we're apparently talking about it in Facebook groups, which I'm not privy to, but someone uh, showed me their upset feelings on Instagram and then I became aware of the upset feelings in Facebook groups. Despite my many disclaimers in the beginning of that video and despite talking truthfully about white and yellow syndrome and linking resources about it in the, in the description from reputable breeders, uh, I still had upset and so I was very hesitant and I'm still hesitant about filming this video, but I'm feeling a bit more brave now than I was last year, so I don't really mind. So let's go ahead and do it. But just like my last video talking about them, we're gonna have disclaimers. If you don't listen to these disclaimers, that is on you. Like if you don't hear out what I have to say and then you end up getting upset, I, I'm sorry, I'm doing my best. Number one disclaimer, this is not meant in any way to be disrespectful to anyone who breeds white and yellows. This is not meant to be disrespectful to anyone who keeps white and yellows. This is not meant to slander the morph as a whole. This is just to talk about white and yellow syndrome, which is a very complicated topic. And I intend to handle it with care and respect throughout this video. And if you don't think that I did, that's okay. You can tell me respectfully in the comments, but in the comments, I will not be tolerating bullying towards me, towards people who breed white and yellow, towards anyone. Okay, we can have an open conversation without bullying, without being rude. And whether that's to me or someone else, I will not be tolerating it on my comments and I won't be tolerating it online. If you have something negative to say about it, you can do it in a constructive way. That's all I'm saying. This video is for people who are not breeders. Most people who watch my videos are not breeders because I'm not a breeder. And most people who watch my videos are like relatively new to keeping reptiles or maybe relatively new to leopard geckos or are introducing themselves to morphs. And so for me to talk about white and yellow syndrome, it is simply just because I want people to be aware when they are shopping for a leopard gecko that maybe this is a morph that you wanna take extra care when you're buying if you wanna buy a white and yellow. Now, breeding is a whole separate thing and I'm not talking about the breeding community in this video. I am strictly going to be talking about white and yellow syndrome. Now, I will be talking about the origins of it and how it came to be and that does include breeding, but this video isn't really for breeders. Most breeders should already know what white and yellow syndrome is and should know where to get white and yellows that don't have the syndrome and how to avoid giving the syndrome to other geckos like that should be something the breeders already know this is for pet keepers if you are interested in neurological disorders in leopard geckos particularly white and yellow syndrome that this should not be like a one stop okay you should be looking into other resources i'm going to include resources down below for you to look at further i should not be the only person that you are learning from there's other people in the community who keep white and yellows who have the syndrome there's tons of people in the community who have white and yellows that don't have a syndrome and you can learn more about white and yellow as a morph, as a whole, from them, not just me. I think I have covered all my bases. Very rude motorcycle. <laughs> the reason I wanna talk about white and yellow syndrome is because I have a handful of geckos with white and yellow syndrome. And the last time I talked about white and yellow syndrome and was told that I shouldn't be talking about it, I had another white and yellow with white and yellow syndrome come to me within like two months. And then like seven months later, I had another one. So since that video, I have received two geckos with white and yellow syndrome, which means it is still out there. It is still prevalent and it's still worth talking about. So that's what I intend to do. Now these very long disclaimers are out of the way. We can actually talk about white and yellow syndrome. I wanna start off by saying that you might be familiar with Enigma syndrome, which is another neurological disorder associated with the Enigma morph of leopard gecko. I've talked about that extensively on this channel and on my other platforms. White and yellow syndrome is not in any way enigma syndrome. There's three key differences between enigma syndrome and white and yellow syndrome and I plan to make a video comparing and contrasting them both later down the road. White and yellow and enigma are completely separate. Enigma in my opinion is worse and there's three key differences. So their symptoms are completely different. Enigma syndrome presents differently than white and yellow syndrome. 
Uh, Enigma syndrome tends to get worse with age or with stressful events where white and yellow syndrome actually tends to get better with age. And Enigma syndrome is directly linked to the Enigma morph. So you won't get Enigmas like multiple lines of enigmas that are free of enigma syndrome. However, white and yellow syndrome is different because there are whole lines of white and yellows that never have a syndrome. That's one of the good things about white and yellow syndrome is that ethical breeders have been able to remove the syndrome from the lines because it's not directly tied to what causes the white and yellow to look the way that it does. If you have an enigma and you pair it with like a tangerine, and the offspring, there's a tangerine and an enigma. The enigma is the only one that can have enigma syndrome. The tangerine cannot because it does not have the enigma morph, okay? With white and yellow, it's not the same. White and yellow, tangerine, they have an offspring. One's a white and yellow, one's a tangerine. The tangerine can have white and yellow syndrome as much as the white and yellow can have white and yellow syndrome because it is not directly tied to the morph. So those are some three key differences between Enigma syndrome and white and yellow syndrome. And I hope that that is sufficient enough for you to realize they are not the same thing or are they related? Okay, now with all that said, nice clarity about that. Let's actually talk about white and yellow syndrome just on its own, not Enigma syndrome, no more disclaimers. Sorry that this was so long, but I'm covering my bases because I'm not trying to get bullied today. The first white and yellow gecko appeared in 1996 as a spontaneous mutation. The gecko was bred to her father over a couple of years to produce geckos with her unique appearance. Since then, the white and yellow morph has been crossed with tons of other morphs to create very visually stunning geckos. Some breeders noticed that their geckos had a syndrome. They had some neurological issues, equilibrium issues, balance issues. And other people who had white and yellows and bred them said, I've never seen that in any of mine. And so for a long time, it was just kind of like a, a myth almost, or they thought maybe there was just something wrong with that individual breed geckos and not something that was related to the community as a whole like it was something that because not a lot of people were experiencing it or not everyone was experiencing it it was hard to gather information about it it was hard to gather like a consensus what made it really complicated is the fact that you can have a gecko who is completely healthy give birth to a gecko that suddenly had a syndrome and this could happen like many generations down the line because a white and yellow can carry the gene that causes the syndrome without displaying it themselves like i mentioned earlier it made it complicated because then people just weren't sure that it was tied directly to the white and yellow like maybe it came from an incubation fluctuation maybe it came from other genetics maybe it came from something else because if you have many generations of white and yellow and then all of a sudden bam there's a neurological disorder it'd be hard to say that like it's directly tied to that um, that lineage because so many of the other geckos had been fine. When the community came to the consensus that there were lines of white and yellow out there that had a syndrome, a lot of breeders decided to selectively breed the syndrome out of them and this took many years but throughout their hard efforts they've been able to get lines of white and yellow that don't have any syndrome, they're completely syndrome free. Now maybe you're wondering if they're able to selectively breed the syndrome out of lines, why is it still out there? Unfortunately there's going to be geckos and breeders who have these geckos who may not notice a slight syndrome or who may not care about the syndrome like they may just breed white and yellows anyway regardless of the syndrome because it only pops up here and there or they don't think it's that big of a deal now i'm not going to be saying like that's a, a mass amount of people i don't think it is but it's enough that the syndrome is still out there because like i said i have a handful of white and yellow geckos that have a syndrome i also have two that i welcomed home la in the last year alone so it's, it's definitely still out there which means it's definitely still worth talking about so i'm gonna go ahead and show a bunch of my white and yellow geckos some that have the syndrome and some that don't just to show you how different that they can all look the white and yellow morph itself is really interesting because it has the ability to bring out the colors and the characteristics of other morphs that's crossed with it the white and yellow morph is known for having like high contrast coloring and also their underside which is white will be pulled up higher onto their sides so instead of having like a yellow or orange body color that goes all the way to the bottom of their body the white will actually creep up and meet more in the middle so they'll have really like i said high contrast because there's a distinction between the top and the bottom that's happening higher up on the body another thing to know about the white and yellow morph is that it is often compared to the enigma morph in its ability to produce visually stunning geckos including creating geckos with white heads and tails so now let's talk about my experience with white and yellow geckos and also white and yellow syndrome so some of my first white and yellows would be benjen and jojen 
Benjen doesn't actually have white nail syndrome. He's got other issues, but that's not related to the morph. It's probably related more to him being a super snow, if I'm completely honest. But when you look at Benjen, you can see that his dotting on the top of his body starts very high up, whereas with other geckos of a similar morph who don't have white and yellow, their spotting goes all the way down to their underside. And then there's Jojen. Jojen is a beautiful boy, very big, but he is a white and yellow that has white and yellow syndrome, and you can see again the high contrast on his sides. Jojen was born with the syndrome he had it when he was just an itty bitty baby and he was sent to me for that reason also welcomed home shireen they came from the same breeder i was getting shireen because she has enigma syndrome but shireen is an enigma cross with white and yellow shireen is no longer with us but she was a white and yellow crossed with enigma i also have Roz, who i got the following year who is a white and yellow cross with enigma and you can see the uh, high contrast on her and typically whenever you cross like enigma and white and yellow you're gonna have like very visually stunning geckos but you're also gonna have really messed up geckos <laughs> i also welcomed home theon theon is a gecko who is not visually a white and yellow he is not a white and yellow morph however he has white and yellow syndrome because his sibling is a white and yellow and doesn't have the syndrome so an interesting case there and then i also have kinvara kinvara is a white and yellow who has the syndrome i also have Aegon, who i welcomed home in january of this year he has the syndrome and then I have a gecko named Mira, who I forgot to list earlier because I got her a long time ago before I got these most recent ones. But Mira is a white and yellow Max Snow, but she does not have the syndrome. I want to say that when I show Benjen and Mira on, on screen, they both have some facial defects. I cannot say that this is related to them being white and yellows at all because there's plenty of white and yellows who don't have defects. It's probably just coming down to incubation fluctuations or bad genetics. I think for Benjen personally, it's because he's got that super snow genetics. A lot of super snows come out with like really weird faces, really small bodies. I think that that's where his comes from. So I just didn't want to put them on the screen and have anyone come to conclusions. Both Mira and her sibling who were different morphs had defects. I think for Mira and her sibling, it was probably related to incubation issues. And then for Benjen, it's just related to him being a super snow. That's my opinion. Uh, again, just saying this so that no one jumps to the conclusion that like white and yellow has deformities. So now let's talk about the symptoms of white and yellow syndrome. And if you watched my video on Enigma syndrome, then you'll notice there's quite a big difference between the white and yellow syndrome symptoms and the Enigma syndrome symptoms. So what are the symptoms for white and yellow syndrome? You'll notice it most when they're moving. They have very exaggerated movements, whether that be like flipping their head up really fast or having really uneven steps. Sometimes they'll step forward so far that they end up falling over. They'll sometimes leap by accident. A lot of their movements you can notice are just overreactions or like very exaggerated movements. I notice that my white and yellows will get excited very easily. So if I approach the enclosure, their symptoms start immediately because they're overexcited. Same thing can be said when they're hunting. They get overexcited about hunting. Geckos with white and yellow syndrome usually have a pretty good outlook or a pretty good prognosis because a lot of geckos who have the syndrome tend to have less symptoms as they get older. It never goes away and there's no cure, but it does get easier as they get older in a lot of cases. Sometimes with white and yellows, tongue feeding is required. However, there's also white and yellows who have the syndrome who are able to eat on their own. I pretty much care for my white and yellows the same way that I care for my regular geckos with the exception of giving them sometimes smaller enclosures. So I have like my biggest white and yellow, Jojen. He's in a 36 by 18 by 12, which a lot of my other geckos are in, but a lot of my smaller white and yellows are going to be in 24 by 18 by 12. This is just to reduce the risk of them injuring themselves when they're like flailing about in their enclosure and just to uh, reduce like the risk of overexcitement or overstimulation. I will say that I don't handle my white and yellows as often as I handle my other leopard geckos that is simply just to keep their stress at a minimum because they tend to do like a flopping over once they get too stimulated, once they get too excited. And so I do keep handling to a minimum for them. All of my white and yellows can shed on their own. They don't need any assistance with shedding and the only extra assistance I give them is tongue feeding. One thing that you'll want to do if you have a gecko that has a neurological disorder of any kind is keep Neosporum without pain reliever on hand, that is without pain reliever. The reason you want to have it on hand is because a lot of times geckos with neurological issues, including the white and yellows, will bump their faces or their bodies against something in their enclosure because they've misstepped or they've over-exaggerated their movements and in doing so, 
they might like nick their face or a part of their body. This happens to them from time to time. It's okay. It's just part of having a gecko with disabilities. Just make sure you keep it clean by putting some Neosporin on it without pain reliever. And another thing that I do for my white Nilos is I do not give them substrate. So I tried giving Jojen substrate back when I first was giving my leopard gecko substrate like a year ago. And Jojen didn't have it for very long because every single time Jojen does a head bob like this or takes an exaggerated step and then falls over, he would get substrate in his nostrils. So obviously we don't want that. So for neurologically disabled geckos, you might not want to use substrate. You can give it a try if you want to, but my recommendation is no substrate. I said this in my video about Enigma syndrome, but the best thing you can do for your geckos that have neurological issues like a white and yellow is to make sure that you are offering them the best husbandry that you possibly can give them. The reason for that being a healthy gecko is going to have less symptoms or they're going to be able to control their syndrome as much as possible. Like, for example, if you have an unhealthy gecko, they're going to exhibit more symptoms because their body is stressed out and the stress creates more symptoms for them. That's especially the case with Enigma. Uh, white and yellow, not as much, but it's just good advice all around to make sure your husbandry is on par when you're keeping a disabled gecko. So that is how I care for my white and yellow syndrome geckos. As you can see, I don't have to keep them in as small of an enclosure as my Enigmas, but I also have to take some precautions. I can't treat them like they are abled geckos. Now, the last thing I wanna talk about is should you buy a white and yellow gecko? That is completely up to you. If you take this information and you say, mm, maybe I don't wanna support that, that's okay. If you take this information and you say, I love that more, if it's gorgeous, I wanna go find a white and yellow that doesn't have the syndrome, that's okay. If you watch this video and you're suddenly inspired to rescue and help, neurologically disabled geckos, I recommend starting out by contacting breeders and saying, hey, if you ever have one that has a neurological issue, I'm down to take them in. You can also check Craigslist. I have found Enigmas and White and Yellows on Craigslist before. Just something to keep in mind. It is very stressful and can be expensive. So if you're not down for that, I probably recommend just a regular abled gecko. Ultimately, the decision is up to you. If you wanna breed white and yellows, that's up to you. I'm not gonna tell you how to live your life. I can only show you my experience and then you can come to your own conclusions. And of course, like I said, make sure you're checking other information, other resources about white and yellow and white and yellow syndrome. For me personally, I'm drawn to keeping geckos with syndromes, geckos with disabilities. It's something that I feel very passionate about. That's why I talk about it on my channel. The reason I keep white and yellow syndrome geckos is because I have like a purpose in life, I feel like, to help disabled animals. And I think it all stems from like, I'm very fascinated with the brain. I think even subconsciously, I decided to keep geckos with neurological issues because of it. I have a degree in psychology that I don't use. <laughs> just have a degree in psychology for pretty much no reason. Um, it was a good degree. I mean, I liked my time in college, but still I don't use it like as a profession. So I just find it interesting that when I got into reptile keeping, I, without like intending to, went towards neurologically disabled geckos. And I also have a degree in psychology. So it's kind of interesting. Whatever you feel called to, if you feel called to breed white and yellows because you want to make syndrome free lines, great. If you feel called to keeping white and yellows because they're gorgeous, great. I'm not here to judge you or say what you should and shouldn't do. That's the end of this video. I hope that I have not ruffled any tail feathers. I hope that everybody is uh, well-informed and happy. I don't know how to end this video because it gives me anxiety just to think about putting this on YouTube. Not sponsored, but this is my beverage. This is my, my comfort beverage. That's why I have it here with me. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, leave a like, leave a comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell. If you have any commentary that you would like to add to this video, please do so respectfully down below. Any interactions you have with people, be respectful. People will be more open-minded to hearing you out and having a conversation with you if you are respectful about it. So I only ask that you give me respect, I'll give you respect, and you give everyone respect in the comments that you interact with. I'd also like to apologize if this video upset anybody. It was definitely not my intention. I just wanted to talk about white and yellow syndrome and my experience with it. So I hope I gave enough disclaimers and apologies ahead of time because I'm not looking for drama, okay? Like, I'm just not. All right, that's all for this one. I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.